Good morning. European unity in a disordered world. And what a great panel. Uh, I think we should start with give them a, a big applause. As you all know, the theme of this meeting, our annual meeting, is uh, history at the turning point. And uh, this has definitely, the last months, been a historical turning point for Europe. Professor uh, Fukushima's um, uh, once said, uh, end of history, uh, that was in 92. But I think um, the last months have been kind of a start of uh, history, at least start of a new chapter in history for Europe. I think we're all uh, very comforted with the unity that Europe has shown. Um, we also have seen that uh, the results of the war in Ukraine has not been probably what the calculation was uh, in Kremlin. And uh, with Mr. Putin, we see two new member countries probably joining NATO. We have seen a unity on sanctions from the EU that is uh, quite unique. We also have seen um, forcefulness in building a new vision uh, for Europe that is very, very strong. And with this panel, with um, Edward Heger, Prime Minister of the Slovak Republic, Christine Lagarde, President of uh, European Central Bank, uh, then the Prime Minister uh, of um, Ireland, uh, Mr. Martin, uh, Roberta Mezzola, the new President of the European Parliament, and Mark Rutte, the long-standing Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Almost a decade now, Mark, isn't it? Uh, Twelve years, we are still a democracy. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations! What uh, what what the stamina? You, I, I think you will not uh, you will not end before you beat uh, Mrs. Merkel's record, will you? It's up to the voter. Yeah. Uh, no. So uh, a great panel. So let's um, let, let's start with you, uh, Mark uh, Rutte, Prime Minister of uh, Netherlands and uh, true European. In March, you said it's time to build a stronger more resilient Europe, and where Europe really needs to be a global player. Will we see this manifesting, or will European meetings be discussions and discussions among 26, 27 member countries? I think we will still see those debates, uh, and sometimes going into the night, that is unavoidable, and it is not a problem in itself. The, the problem we have is that the European Union has for too long been a playing field instead of the player. So others were playing on our field. Uh, we have now, in, uh, in, uh, at such a quick pace, decided on sanctions and our reactions to Russia. I believe we should now uh, step up uh, our game. That means, uh, for, the for the short term, uh, we have to invest in our defense capabilities. We are doing that, and then we're spending an extra five billion. We have seen the speech of Olaf Scholz at the end of February, spending another 100 billion um, and bringing Germany structurally to the 2% uh, mark. Um, we have to work very hard to keep the international coalition together on Ukraine. The 141 countries who voted in favor of the resolution condemning the aggression. But the much harder stuff will be for the longer term. And that means that, first of all, as a European Union, I believe we should get rid of the unanimity in the European Council on issues like uh, sanctions, um, but also human rights declarations. Secondly, each of us, we need to do much more in Europe to build an, a stronger economies, uh, not enough reforms in place. I'm not talking about um, um, uh, fiscal um, uh, tightening of our economies, but reforming our economies, pensions, housing market, the labor market, etc. that will open up huge possibilities for extra economic growth uh, in Europe, and it will also make it stronger. Uh, and most importantly, to really leverage the strength of the internal market. It is the, it is the most powerful internal market in world history. And everybody in the world wants to get connected to the European Union, and we are not really leveraging the power of that internal market. 
and then asking others if they want to join us or to, to be part of that internal market in a sense of working with us from Asia, Africa or whatever part of the world, what do we want in return? Finally, it will also require the very big countries in Europe, Italy, uh, France and Germany to give up on some sovereignty on their foreign policy. Because if uh, Paris and Berlin and Rome uh, want to continue to be foreign policy powers on their own, um, it will be very difficult for the European Union as a whole to really leverage our uh, collective power. So it will also, I believe, lead to some very uh, fundamental debates in the three biggest uh, European economies. Do you think that will happen? I think it has to happen to a certain extent. I'm not saying that um, these countries and the Netherlands and Spain and others could not, and, and the countries present at this platform, could not conduct their own foreign policy. Of course, we have to do that. Uh, uh, we are still independent sovereign nations. But if you really want to leverage the collective power of Europe uh, and next to being an economic powerhouse, uh, also being projecting our economic power in a political sense at the world stage, it means that we have to coordinate much more together. Uh, and that cannot only be done in the European Council or in the Foreign Affairs Council or the European Parliament. This also needs to be done in our heads in a, in, in a sense that we understand that we stand stronger together, um, and that means for the biggest economies to use their power uh, to really support that collective European uh, stance on the world stage. If I understand you correctly also then, uh, Mark, is that uh, if you pull all these powers together, um, the largest markets uh, in the history uh, of the world, um, and moving them uh, from being a playing field, as you said, to be a player. I guess you're also saying this because there are other big players around too, the G2, for example. But do you think that Europe will be able then uh, to be uh, the third player, so we will in the future have a G3, and so Europe doesn't end uh, between a rock and a hard place. Is that well, what you're saying? Yeah, and in terms of market size, we should be the G1, eh? because we are bigger than the US, we are far bigger than China, um, but because we have not really added up uh, that collective uh, GDP, in a sense, what it means in terms of our uh, power uh, worldwide, um, uh, it, but we are not that effective as we should be. And then the question in Europe is, do we support on this issue or the other issue, the Americans or the Chinese? Or where are we? Of course, we will always have a very strong relationship with the United States. The transatlantic bond, for me personally, for the Netherlands, I think for most in Europe, is crucial. But um, it, it should not um, mean that we could not have our own foreign policy objectives, of course, working uh, very strongly together with the Americans and where possible uh, with others. But now the, the, the crisis in Ukraine shows us uh, how important it is. And I think we were all amazed by how fast we were able to, to, uh, um, um, uh, to react. Of course, now the worry is about uh, the, the oil uh, sanctions. And can we be able in the six sanction factions to agree on an oil embargo against uh, Russia? And we know that some countries have issues here. Uh, but I really hope we can crack that nut, uh, be it on Monday, Tuesday in the European Council or as soon as possible uh, after that. Thank you. Uh, moving to you, Roberta uh, Mazzola, you just uh, took over as the president of the European Parliament uh, just very shortly before the war in Ukraine. And this, of course, also has shaped um, your role as president in the European Parliament. And what we have seen is that uh, what is happening in the periphery or uh, in the proximity of Europe also has huge impact on Europe. This time it was Ukraine, but we also know that the West Balkans uh, are there. So uh, Europe's role is also not only then to become a global player, as Mark Rutte was saying, but isn't it also to export stability in its uh, neighborhood? And there is no 10 years since uh, Europe enlarged itself and got Croatia on board uh, and Europe has created a lot of hope in the West Balkans. Uh, Albania and North Macedonia uh, are waiting uh, for your response. And Ukraine also now hope for a European path. 
what could you say about this? Uh, can Europe uh, walk the talker, or are they going to take 10 more years before any decisions are made on new member countries? Well, thanks a lot uh, for, for having me here. Uh, it, it, I would never have imagined on the day of my election uh, that this uh, uh, conversation we would be having here uh, has uh, all the multi-layered nuances uh, and real existential questions of a post-24 February world. Uh, Pre-24 February is not one world we can ever go back to. And I think, picking up on what Mark said, that rather than talk about where the decisions are taken, but start from what happens in our head, I think if we look uh, at the European Union or at the European project as a very uh, successful coming together of countries uh, that, that share fundamental principles, beliefs, uh, and fight against um, uh, autocracy uh, and anyone uh, who does not believe that democracy is the, the basis of, uh, of what uh, we are all uh, in, in this for, then I think we can really talk about the European Union as being a, a transformative uh, power um, uh, politically uh, with uh, successful, very successful enlargements. Uh, I come from a country that uh, whose generation campaigned for years to enter uh, the European Union. Uh, this is uh, why I entered politics, because I wanted my country to hold up those standards and also to offer that protection uh, collectively if something went wrong. And I think if we start from that departing point, then for all those countries who share those values and principles, and of course enlargements are, are, uh, are always difficult, They're, every country has its own path, uh, every country has its own different realities. We're talking about, you mentioned, uh, um, uh, the latest enlargement, but also countries that have been for over uh, a decade uh, waiting to be given uh, the hope for the doors to be open. But also now this has also fundamentally shifted with the war uh, on Ukraine and the new applications of, of Georgia and Moldova. And I think the question we need to ask ourselves is, uh, are we ready to open uh, our doors for countries that are fighting for the principles that we share. Uh, and if we are ready to say yes, then it is not only about um, uh, economies, it is not only about numbers, it is not ab only about how many seats and how much power goes in that institution, it is about whether the European Union wants to be the global democratic power uh, in an immediate neighborhood where we have a common adversi uh, adversary. Uh, adversary. So I think that I would answer that question with now is the time that we are faced with crucial decisions uh, next week but also in the months to come. If we are ready to hold that unity going forward then I think we can really show that we are ready to take those decisions that are needed from us. Well thank you so much. I was uh, just uh, also reflecting um, on the past when new members were uh, invited to the EU was also an aspiration for making them stronger democracies and stronger believer in the values that the EU holds uh, there. When Spain, Portugal, Greece were let, uh, what was opened and invited as members, they were not totally perfect democracies at the time, but we, they have now developed into very strong democracies and beacons of this uh, in uh, Europe. So, uh, is, is this now, you think, is a game changer we're faced with also in the EU, that they, the EU will see that if Ukraine is not invited, if the West Balkans are not invited, this will be areas where uh, Russia will then use this as a playground for uh, their uh, way of uh, doing politics, and then the EU will regret it uh, 10 years uh, later, because those problems end on the EU's uh, table, and you feel that this momentum is there in the EU you now, that there can be a consensus, and can one small country, for example, stop the whole process? I was not thinking about Malta. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, well, I, I think that what we are looking at now with a war, not in our neighborhood, but in our continent, on our continent, in Europe, uh, where there is a country that has for far too long blackmailed and threatened the rest of the European Union. Uh, and 
we, I think, for far too long looked away when our colleagues from those countries that border Russia, who told us we have a problem, for too long we have depended on for far too, let's say, it was way too easy for us to continue to rely uh, on gas with some countries being 100% reliant. For way too long, we did not actually seriously consider creating an energy union where we can rely on each other rather than uh, on, on a country that could switch us, switch us off at any time. And of course there are different discussions in different member states. It makes a difference between whether you are on the neighborhood or with a common border with that country or not, or whether you have invested more in renewables, you are further ahead also economically. But at the same time, what we cannot risk is that we ourselves cause instability in those neighboring countries because of our failure to act. Uh, and this uh, is a fear and a concern that I have. It is a concern that the European Parliament has. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a, a, a parliament that is it's very difficult to find majorities, even br at least of all broad majorities on anything. But on this, uh, members of the European Parliament from all countries, bar none, have gotten together and said, this is Europe's moment. We, we did not think that we could do so much during the pandemic. We did not think that we could uh, push to the European level our competences over health. Um, uh, we could not uh, think that we are really going to talk about uh, potentially, now this is sensitive, opening the, the treaty up and saying where uh, can we fill the gaps because 10 years have passed and we look like we, we are realizing that we are not addressing the problems that we really have. And I think that now, uh, after the, the Conference on the Future of Europe, with um, uh, leaders of our countries that are saying we can do more, uh, both from a, from a financial uh, aspect, we've done so much during the pandemic, are we ready to look at our countries on our neighborhood and say, you are on the path, there are rules that you need to follow. Once you're in, this I link back to your question, you need to continue following those rules because we have those countries who tell us it is far uh, harder to get into the European Union uh, and follow the rules than we hold ourselves accountable to. And that is a big question that we need to ask ourselves as European Union and member states. And whether all those countries are ready to say, we can see Europe as a project for peace. I am convinced that this is the moment. And if we don't, I think we would have failed. No, thank you so much. That's an uh, extremely interesting uh, point. Uh, you have to stick to the highest standards to become a member today. And if you first became a member, you can be more complacent than, about them and it doesn't necessarily have uh, any uh, impact on you. Do, do you even see that members, do you think members should be kicked out if they continuously don't stick to the rules? Short answer, and then we'll go to Prime Minister of Ireland. Right. Yeah. No, no, Roberta, uh, maybe you can. Do you think they should be kicked out if they over time neglect what the Commission is saying? I'm not going to use football analogies and who could be kicked off uh, the playing field. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I would continue to wish that the United Kingdom was still a member of the European Union. Uh, I uh, really um, uh, would think that we would be stronger today uh, in the current scenario uh, with the Euro United Kingdom still uh, being a member. So I'm not going into who's in and who's out, but I'm going to say uh, that our, when we talk about rule of law, we need to take it seriously. Uh, and we did not take it seriously. Uh, we did not even, you know, if you asked citizens at uh, elections what rule of law meant in countries, they would not, uh, they would either not answer or give you different, different answers of what they thought it meant. Uh, we have been extremely um, strong on the fact uh, that conditionality needs to mean that you cannot disburse funds uh, to countries that not play by the rules that target minorities, that think that they are above the law, and that they think politicians should be protected even if they break it. No, uh, and that's am... not a question that we, that is not something that we will move away from. It's Thank you. Answer. So we have yellow cards, we have red cards, and then uh, you also, if you get enough red cards, you can Depends play for a while. Card. Okay, um, Prime Minister Martin of uh, Ireland, um, uh, Roberta just said that this is Europe's moment, and uh, for Ireland, 
50 years of EU membership uh, this year. It's also uh, the country in Europe, when I saw the last statistics, that the support of the EU is the strongest. I think Ireland has benefited a lot from the EU, but also has contributed a lot to the EU. We are at a historical turning point. So where would you like to see the EU moving? And also, where, can, where are the new projects? Is it uh, in the green transition with freedom fuels? Is it uh, in the technology field where we know you have been a big player? Also know with the vision of um, also microchips uh, and also building a stronger Europe in that sense? Yeah, well, well first of all, we're, we're celebrating 100 years of an unbroken democracy in Ireland uh, this year and 50 years in terms of accession to the European Union. Uh, and accession to the European Union was the most, one of the most transformative events in modern Ireland. Uh, not just economically, but in terms of the broader area of public policy, uh, liberalization, um, and self-confidence, and outward-looking um, nation. Uh, so it was quite uh, uh, the transformative um, event in itself. And interestingly, uh, just uh, the Brexit experience has actually, um, if you like, developed a stronger pro-European position. Because people have just looked at Brexit and said, no, no, we don't want that uh, in any shape or form because it hasn't been well planned, well prepared, with the greatest you know, respect to, uh, to, 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 to my good neighbours and so on. Uh, that has not landed well in terms of Irish public opinion in terms of how that was conducted. In terms of the, the future, we do see the future in terms of the green economy, uh, in terms of digitalization, but also I would agree with Roberta in terms of enlargement. Uh, as a country that benefits so much, we were one of the poorest countries in Europe when we, before we joined. So we know the transformative impact it has on uh, countries. So we're very reluctant, I am anyway, to say to another country, you cannot join or you should not join. I find that difficult given that we benefited in joining the European Union. So that's the kind of starting point. Uh, when I was at the Western Balkan summit, I felt, uh, you know, the situation with Albania and North Macedonia is now beyond, really, uh, comprehension. Uh, I understand the politics of it and so on, but they should be members by now. They've done a lot of work and so on like that. We cannot complain about Russia's manipulation and geopolitical manipulation if we're not proactive enough uh, in terms of dealing with that by promoting and supporting uh, those who ha are, are of a pro-European Union disposition in the neighborhood countries. And so we really have to work on that much more proactively than we have because the world simply does not stand still. Back to Mark's playing field, you know, if you hang around the pitch too long watching, a few goals will go in against you, you know. And I think there's that element uh, to what we're about. Uh, and. Um, so you, you have to keep moving um, because the world doesn't stop. Uh, and so that enlargement question is one that's going to loom. Also the question of power and what do we mean by a superpower. Uh, I, I felt, uh, we were talking about this earlier, that people have underestimated the European response to COVID-19. I would have been a Minister for Health during SARS in the early 2000s, and Europe was not equipped to deal with a potential pandemic then. On this occasion, the capacity of the Commission and Member States to pull industry together with Member States and become the largest exporter of vaccines in the world and the largest donor, uh, and also developing supply chains and the product, pr pr product, pr production capacity to make all of that happen was a very significant achievement. And likewise, in respect of Ukraine, the unanimity on the first round of sanctions was something to behold. I mean, when the Prime Ministers came together, Sometimes, historically, there might have been a view that maybe people will try and roll back some of the sanctions. In fact, Prime Minister said, we want to strengthen what's on the table already uh, in, in a unanimous way. And I think that was uh, quite a significant moment um, in, in itself. And I agree with Mark in respect of the economic uh, potential of Europe, but we should do so based on values. It's not about being powerful for the sake of being powerful. It's about also having a clear set of values, uh, basing our relationships on trust with other countries and other areas of the world. And we do need stronger alignment between democracies 
uh, and people who believe in fundamental rights in terms of free media, uh, the freedom of the individual, freedom of expression, all of which are under attack to varying degrees in different countries. And I do actually think that one of the great challenges over the next 50 years will be the uh, continuing, if like, campaign to hold on to those fundamental values and not to compromise on them. Uh, because we can see the slippery slope in, in many countries in terms of media uh, control and so forth. No, uh, thank you uh, so much, um, Prime Minister. Uh, beyond comprehension that uh, there is uh, no final agreement on North Macedonia and Albania, uh, does the EU uh, need to look also at the right of um, current members and new members uh, to veto processes, uh, to veto processes, because everyone yep. has to agree. Is that something that has to come on the table? One question. The other one, I, you said it cannot compromise in the EU on um, the values, freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of press. Then I'm coming back to my football, the, the cards, the football playing field red cards, yellow cards, and all this. Because let's be frank, there are members of the Europe EU today that um, there are questions raised from many if they're really complying with this. That is portrayed as a bit of complacency. And you also said, Prime Minister, that we have to learn from uh, the approach uh, to Russia. Maybe we were uh, too complacent on this, also on the energy field and etc. Do you think we're too complacent with those that are not sticking to the rules today and we can regret it more down uh, the road if we keep kicking the can down the road? Well, I'm not so sure we're kicking it down the road that much longer either. I think we need a strong referee, right? So I think that is needed um, with layers of sanctions. And when I became uh, prime minister, my very first EU council meeting was on the next generation and it was quite tough conversations in terms of rule of law uh, and the connection between rule of law and the size and deployment of funds so that did happen and that was a very very serious debate that went in late to the morning so I think actually that change has happened already Eric, if I may say so and I think you are looking at more challenging debates we, we are already witnessing this in terms of some member states who are seeking the deployment of funds that has been stalled uh, because of these very, very questions. Um, but the, the, the point about Russia is valid. When you look back and you look at Salisbury or you look at the Polonium in London, and I watched documentaries on the first one recently, and it struck me that was a public health attack on citizens of Europe in the United Kingdom. It wasn't just, it was terrible that they were endeavoring to murder an individual but there was a wider public health um, alarm and threat to many, many people. And kind of a few diplomats were sent home. And that was kind of it. Uh, and I think that in, in hindsight, when you look back, you, one, one can indulge too much and we can be too complacent. Or we can hope that the better side of the, the, the country will, will emerge eventually. We cannot take that for granted any longer. And we have to be very careful, I think, of state control of media, uh, any attempts by governments, no matter who they are, to sort of encroach on that independence of media or to target um, various groups and so forth um, in society. And we do really have to call that out, uh, particularly in terms of the freedoms of, of the LGBTQI community, for example, uh, where there have been unacceptable moves in member states uh, uh, against um, uh, the, 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 uh, people and, and so on. And that's not a that's not something we can indulge or be complacent about. Uh, on the veto rights. Sorry, and yeah, we're open, even though we, 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 we've, we've had concerns about some aspects, but if Europe is to move, and coming out of the conference for Europe, I take a more open approach. I may have colleagues who may not agree with me, we will have a debate internally, but we can't stand still, is my point. And if we enlarge, then there, there are obvious consequences to enlargement in terms of governance, mechanisms by which we make decisions, take decisions. I, I'm, of course, I understand that. And I think we have to move with that too. No, thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Um, 
moving now to uh, president of the European Central Bank, um, Christine Lagarde. Um, the largest market in the history of humankind, Europe, single market. Uh, Europe uh, saw uh, quite considerable uh, growth uh, also uh, post-COVID, but no, it is slowing after the war. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg said yesterday we have to be willing to pay a price for our freedom. Uh, we have put uh, trade and access to cheap energy uh, first and not uh, the principles. Seen from your viewpoint, uh, Christine, you have vast experience uh, from IMF but also as a minister in France. Um, how to keep the optimism and the progress uh, for Europe uh, if you know see a slowing economy and um, also uh, higher energy prices, how to keep the European ID and unity alive? You press something. No, no, no. no, I don't need to press anything. Thank you very much, Morgan, and uh, good, uh, good morning to, uh, to all of you. You know, I often ask myself, um, this wonderful European idea, is it dawn, dust, or twilight? And what can we do about it? And what the Ukraine war has revealed to all of us, certainly in Europe, is that we did not have the right understanding of how large, how powerful, and how strong we are collectively. So to also, I'm, I'm an athlete by background, but I'm not a football player, but I will still use the football analogy. I think it's a good one. I think Europe can be at a new dawn of playing a formidable team of players while at the same time acting as a referee. I know it's a bit inconsistent, but that's okay. We've been playing playing field for long enough and we could actually claim that. What the Ukraine war has revealed to all of us is actually the weaknesses of being that open playing field. Weaknesses in two respects. When you look at the global value chains, Europe is 20% more opened to global uh, value chains vulnerabilities than any other markets in the world. So it's not surprising that the breaking down and the bottlenecks of global value chains affect European companies and us more than others. Second vulnerability that, is, that has been revealed and continues to be revealed by the war in Ukraine is that our sources of energy at large, but also our sources of certain minerals that will prove extremely helpful and necessary for the next generation of our energy mix are actually located in countries that are not very friendly and can actually be extremely aggressive and terrible. So those two vulnerabilities are two that we had not paid enough attention to. Now, luckily, the European Commission that I'm not representing here, but I would, I would like to give them the credit, have identified a list of products where we have vulnerabilities and where we are at risk. That's one of the areas where we have to fix vulnerabilities. When you're an athlete and part of your body doesn't function, you deal with it. The second point I'd like to make, and that's in response to your question, Borger, is that as often in Europe, united in diversity and rising in adversity, we are in that situation of adversity and we need to flex our muscles. We do have collective incredible muscles. I'll give you a few areas where we actually do that a bit and we can do more. In competition policies, yes, we do take action. Yes, we can actually affect companies that are doing things outside Europe, but will have an impact on the European territories. We can stop mergers that are taking place in other places if it is going to affect Europe. In trade, we represent a monumental market that can actually set terms and conditions in negotiations with others. In monetary policy, it so happens that those 19 countries soon to be joined by two new members, you were asking about new members, Croatia, I cross fingers, should soon be joining the club and Bulgaria is next online. So it will soon be 21 countries in one single club. 
by one single currency standard. Well, this is the second international currency in the world. It doesn't have the exorbitant privilege of the dollar, but it is the second international currency of the world. And when monetary policy decisions are made in Frankfurt, the rest of the world in financial circles actually pays attention. It wouldn't have happened if it had been 19, soon to be 20 and 21 different central banks. So when we put our teams together, when we treat our vulnerabilities and flex our muscles, of course we can act. Now, there are lots of areas where we are not doing as good a job as we should, and you alluded to that, Mark. The service sector within the European Union, if only it was in line with the directive that has been approved, it would be formidably larger. There's a potential of about 390 billion euros that can be deployed and leveraged subsequently. When Europe decides to affect as much as it should to defense expenditures under the rules of the NATO club. That's another significant add-on to GDP. And if it was, I'm not sure it's desirable, but economically we have to measure, if it was to return to the uh, Cold War times uh, defense spending, then that would be a significant add-on to that. So when the muscles are flexed, Europe is an incredible force. But we score against our own team occasionally. And by just slowing down the process, by looking at inter instead of European our national interests, eventually we put a little break on our efforts. So given the vulnerabilities we have, given the war at our doorstep that we have to really uh, take a stand and participate in, in our own way, obviously those muscles, I hope, will continue to be flexed. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Christine. Uh, we have to also be willing uh, to flex uh, our uh, muscles. We did flex a lot of muscles when it came to fiscal stimulus um, after and during uh, the pandemic. I think uh, globally we launched 14 trillion um, euros or 13 uh, trillion euros. Never seen this since the Second World War. If we now see a clear slowing of the European economy, partly based on the geoeconomic situation, a slowing uh, China, but also based on the war, what muscles do we have moving forward to flex to avoid a s very slow growth in Europe and high inflation? I don't think we necessarily will see um, recession, but we might see a stagflation if we don't get it right. Okay, Borger, I'm not in the business of uh, creating headlines here. So, um, but what I will say is that in addition to being the largest market in the world, we can also be the largest purchaser in the world. And when I see leaders at the European level decide that they are going to possibly have common purchase action and policies when it comes to gas, when it comes to petrol, when it comes to all sorts of minerals that we're going to need in the near future. It's a formidable, concerted, legitimate action. We do have concerted actions on the part of the sellers. It's about time that the purchasers also have concerted actions, I would contend. Well, thank you, um, Christine. I, I had to try to create some. Headlines. I know, of I course, know, I that's, know. I'm, that's part of my job. Uh, coming now to Prime Minister uh, Heger, uh, Slovakia being also a neighbor with Ukraine. Uh, you yourself has shown strong leadership and also been very clear on condemning um, Russia's uh, war. Um, Madame Lagarde just said that uh, once in a while we do also score against our own team. Um, we maybe have done that uh, in the past when it comes to our uh, approach um, to uh, Russia. The Prime Minister of Ireland was uh, mentioning also that we were a bit complacent or were complacent. We had many indications that this could come. Uh, but no, uh, there is a war. Uh, and uh, what uh, is your strategic outlook and aspiration for Europe now based on what we know now? How do you look at the transatlantic relations moving forward? 
of NATO's military capacity is outside the EU. Um, do we address that elephant in the room inside the EU? And uh, where will we see uh, the support inside EU also to continue to support Ukraine when we might see the economy slowing down and populists using this populist that are maybe also using social unregulated media? Well, thank you very much. Uh, definitely, uh, we do address this elephant uh, in the room. And please let me uh, give you a perspective of a country from Central Europe and Eastern flank, as it was mentioned. First, you know, we have to realize that Europe is a very unique continent. It's diverse and developed. And it's a great opportunity at this moment to become not just a leader, but a translator in much more areas than it was uh, till now. What I mean by that? Europe proved over the last two years that it can be very fast, it can be decisive, and it can be very efficient. Because look at it from this perspective. We have 27 democracies, 27 governments, 27 parliaments who needed to decide during the pandemic, during the energy crisis, during the war on uh, Ukraine. And decisions that took four years in the last decade during the pandemic, it took months and weeks. During the war in Ukraine, days and hours. We were actually able to agree on certain decisions during hours. 27 governments, 27 parliaments. Amazing, amazing what we, what we conducted. And why was it? Because we understood that the priorities must be shaped in a way, unity and cooperation. If the priorities are set in this manner, then we can be very, very fast. We can actually show the whole world that the most difficult, the most comp uh, the diverse and developed continent can actually be very active and could be a leader and translator. And when we look at the war in Ukraine, it wasn't just because pandemic was about cooperation and helping each other. So being so, uh, the solidarity between the countries within. But with war in Ukraine, we proved the solidarity outside of Europe. The fast reaction, we as a country, next bordering to, to Ukraine. First, we came in place. We immediately helped with the refugees coming to Slovakia. And it was 400,000 people came to Slovakia or, uh, across, the, across the border. Five million nation, 400,000. 70,000 state in Slovakia. But immediately, I got calls from my colleagues. Hey, Edward, how can we help you? Such a wonderful response, the unity that, that was there. And uh, one more thing, the energies and the transatlantic. The energies, we have to realize that also Slovakia is an example that we underestimated uh, the, the connection to the Russian oil and gas. We basically, we basically traded our values for cheap gas and oil for too long. There was a decision of a government from 2006 that we need to diversify, and we're still not there yet. But now we are very close to it, and we, we need the solidarity, because we were a very reliable uh, partner on transiting the Russian gas for decades to the West. Now we say we need to disconnect. We need to disconnect as soon as possible. Decision has been made. But for this, we need the cooperation of the countries because we are landlocked. We need the same reliability of the partners around us. And we can do it. I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to achieve. And one more thing we need to learn from this, we have to stop compromising. Because compromising Putin caused that we have a war in Ukraine, aggressive war, people are dying. We compromised too long with him. And it's a, such a big lesson learned for us. And the same thing, com compromising among us. And I think the first step to get out of compromising is to be honest to each other. That's the first step. We don't have to go immediately into, into get somebody out of uh, you. I think that's the very last step. And we should, we should never get there. Because if we get there, we did something wrong in the unity and in the cooperation. If we have the priorities set right, and if we keep the priorities, we'll never get to that scenario. We'll just become stronger. And that's what Mark said. We are a player in not playing field. And we are the biggest market. Let's utilize it for the world. The world needs it because we can be a translator. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister, and thank you, uh, Edward. Thank you also for the solidarity uh, you have shown uh, with the Ukrainian uh, people. I know as a neighbor 
country of Ukraine and also uh, deep understanding um, of uh, the West Balkans, but also on the dynamics uh, in, in your region. Um, I guess you also have thought through what can the next steps be from Mr. Putin? Because I think we think no, uh, there is of course no more question of a rapprochement. Uh, the genie is out of the bottle. Uh, and we are according, we, we are acting accordingly. But uh, also, for someone that knows Russian history and Russian thinking, and uh, I think we both have dealt a lot with Russia uh, for decades, there are always some new surprises possibly around the corner. Transnistria, for example, Moldova in the West Balkans. So what, where do you think the next, next trouble will come? And how ready are we to move very fast, as you underlined, yeah. in the most diverse and developed part of the world and the trend center? Yeah. First of all, it's not going to be a trouble. It's going to be a challenge. We need to look at the troubles as the challenges. Because right, right now, uh, look at the last decade. We had a crisis, 2008, 2011. And then we had very good years of growth. This decade will be different. We had huge, I mean, huge crisis, so many in such a short time. And there are other challenges still facing because it was such a shock to the whole world, to the democratic world. It wake, woke up our values and it waking up us, uh, whether, we are, uh, whether we are truthful to, this, to these values. So that's the first thing we need to, we need to understand. It's, it's challenges. And we have to be very, I would say, offensive. And please understand me correctly. With Putin, we were too defensive for too long. We have to be bold. Democratic world must be bold and show this is the best way of living to the whole world. And we will show you by action. And the action is, we will support Ukraine. They must win. We'll support them with the humanitarian aid, but also military aid. Because they're defending themselves. They're defending our values. they shedding their own blood for our values. We don't have to. If, Slova if Ukraine fails, Slovakia is next. I tell you, Slovakia is next. We don't want to allow that. And I, I, I believe that you're going to help us that not to happen. So, so that's, that's why we need to help them to win. We need to give them hope. They need hope. These people are fighting every day. Imagine every day, not for a week, for months. Every day wake up, in fact. And you must be tired of it. But you have to fight. So they need our hope, I think. And they want to work as hard. I mean, we as a Slovakia almost missed the train to European Union in 1998. The government changed and we were able to catch up. We are one of the last countries that joined European Union. And it caused such a transformation, just like, just like uh, uh, Prime Minister of Ireland said, Michael. And we experienced how much it helped us. Let's provide this to any country. But reforms and investments must go hand in hand. The country must understand. You want to be part of EU? Please accept our, our principles, accept our rules, and work with us. We'll help you, but you must meet the criteria. Ukraine is very willing to meet the criteria. They don't want to lower the criteria. They want our help. So let's provide it to them. And the same goes with Western Balkans, to any country. You want to be part of it? Yes, come. We'll help you. We'll work with you. We'll help you to, make, uh, to be ready. Once you're ready, you join. Let's not give them timelines of decades. Why? If they work hard, I mean, we were able to catch up. We were able to catch up with Czech Republic, Poland, and, and Hungary, and we were missing two years. The European Commission came and helped us. We are the example that it, it works. So let's give the same example to Ukraine. Let's help them, and also to Western Balkans, to Georgia, to Moldova. I think, and they, they can prove how fast they can achieve it. And once they do, once they meet the criteria, be welcome. I'm speaking uh, in general in principles, but I really believe that this is the great opportunity for us. And, and we, have to, we have to be bold, hardworking, and, uh, and committed, and, and we'll succeed. Definitely we'll succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, what, what a fascinating uh, panel. I, I feel very privileged to, to be a moderator here. I, I know we could continue for a long time. We have a few minutes left. I was thinking, uh, Mark, uh, going back to your uh, opening uh, picture about not being the playing field or not being played, 
but uh, start to be a real player. And uh, G1 was even launched. Uh, but uh, coming back to uh, being a real power playing, this economic aspect, we, Europe is the largest market in the world. But um, to my point, about 80% of the military capacity in NATO is outside the EU. Can that continue like that? Can, can your EU be a real player if it doesn't also have the military strength in such a polarized world? Will it happen? And do we have talked a lot about the risk from the East, but we also know that uh, some actors say that the big political risk that we're faced with uh, is um, the polarization in the United States of America. Well, first of all, the, the basis of all of this has to be our economy. And I uh, very much uh, agreed with uh, Christine uh, that we still have a large untapped potential in the internal market, particularly in the area of services. And there was a report, I think, by the European Parliament a couple of years ago, the cost of non-Europe. And the cost of non-Europe was the then size of the Russian economy. You could add to the collective of the European economies, the size of the Russian economy, not them joining obviously, but collectively S27, creating more economic power uh, between 1.2 and 1.5 billion euros, the size of the Russian economy, if we would have uh, the services market as part of our internal market. And how luckily we have now agreed on the Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act, but it has to be implemented. So just I wanted to emphasize uh, that point and of course our national reforms, pensions, housing market, labor market, that will untap the potential at the national level. That's the only way really to become a powerful at the world stage. To your question, I believe there is no problem in the world for the next 50 to 100 years we can solve without the United States. They are so powerful and I'm so happy that we are in that transatlantic relationship. But you are completely right in what you are basically implying with your question. We cannot leave the bill to them. We have to pay our part for ourselves. We are at this moment 50% of the complete, the total economy, Canada, US, European Union. We are 50%, they are 50%. They are now paying 75% of the bill. We are paying 25% of the bill. That is completely unsustainable. And I'm so happy that after this horrible invasion, we all decided to step up our defense spending. And, and we already had committed in January to 3 billion extra. We have now committed to another 2.2 or 2.4 billion extra. So uh, that will mean an extra 40% of defense spending, bringing us in 2024 to the 2%. Uh, what, what Germany did, what all the others are doing. And that is crucial because, yes, that bond is, we are inseparable in NATO from the US. And they are inseparable from us because this is also in their interest that we stay independent and connected to the US and that Russia and others are not gaining power over us. It's also a crucial strategic interest for the United States. But we have to pay our part of the bill. Here, Trump was right when he emphasized this in 2018 in a NATO summit. Obama started this with the Welsh pledge in 2014. They were right. I'm happy we are now fulfilling that. And it's the only way to uh, uh, also become next to a soft power. You also have to be a hard power. So, uh, uh, last question to you, uh, uh, Mark. Prime Minister Martin said it's beyond comprehension that uh, we are not giving a clear answer to North Macedonia and Albania. Do you agree? Yeah, completely. And, and this, is, this is really an issue. North Macedonia and Albania have worked for years to uh, gain candidate status. For years. My country was extremely reluctant for many years, and we agreed in 2019 uh, with, with all the others to, to, to grant candidate status to, to Albania and North Macedonia. Now it is being blocked not on Albania, but on North Macedonia, and most of us couple the two together. Um, but here I think we also have to be very precise how we deal with Ukraine accession uh, wish and Moldova and Georgia over the next three or four months. Take Bosnia. Bosnia at this moment does not have candidate status. It has the perspective of candidate status and still has to fulfill 14 tasks before they can move from prospective candidate to candidate. So I think we have to take all of this into account when we discuss uh, what the Commission will come up with with the AV 
on Moldova, Georgia, and of course on Ukraine, I asked Ursula von der Leyen to be brutally honest with us on the pluses and the minuses of these uh, three countries, and then to have a very thorough debate. But we cannot have that debate in the European Council without thinking uh, of the Western Balkans and the stability uh, in that part of the European Union. It has to be also part of our discussions. Thank you. I can now give the four uh, remaining, uh, remaining uh, panelists one minute and then we'll end on time. So, Roberta, going to you. One minute. One, one thought. Uh, I'm being increasingly faced by journalists asking questions about using the words face saving, appeasement. How can we? Um, title this over so that uh, we can move on? And my answer is, this is not the time to talk about face-saving for Russia. This is not the time to talk for appeasement. It is the time where we have to put all our efforts, all our efforts, no using of legal arguments, lack of political will, excuses for Ukraine, not to win this war. This is, I think, the thread that we will see throughout all the meetings that we have, not only this day, but in the next few days leading up to the European Council next week. I do not want to hear the word or have to be able to give answers as to how we are going to save face of Putin. I do not want to hear the word appeasement anymore. So, uh, thank you, Madam President, uh, Prime Minister. Yeah, I, I would uh, strongly agree with that. And um, I think what has happened uh, at this moment in time, it's not just the political leadership across Europe, but the people of Europe has said enough is enough in respect of uh, Russian aggression. The idea that big countries have spheres of influence and that smaller states don't have the right uh, to make their own political choices and decision making in terms of whatever group they wish to join is completely unacceptable. Uh, and people have said very clearly, enough is enough. Uh, I think we have to double down ourselves as, uh, within the European Union in terms of strengthening our capacities, but also, and it's been mentioned here in terms of uh, leveraging our economic power and so on, but also doing things creatively. I like what we're doing in Africa in respect of health. At long last, we're putting strategic investment to give African countries the capacity to develop MNR, mRNA technology, not just in respect to vaccines, but in terms of other medicines, through technology transfer, but through building up know-how and real capacity on the ground in Africa. And we have to trust in ourselves to, to build on those relationships, which will take time. And there'll be ups and downs, and we feel let down from time to time, but you just have to keep at it, because the long haul works. Uh, and we just have to, if we have a clear guiding star and, and, and our values are that, then I think we will be uh, a very strong player in the best sense of that concept, to bring good to the world. Uh, not to control the world, not to dominate, not to not be naive either, but really to change the dial in terms of quality of life, in terms of hunger and starvation and so on, and to give economic capacity to less developed regions within the world in the context of a strong, proactive, uh, relationship with the European Union. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. A player uh, that are uh, arguing for compliance with the UN Charter, that might be a good idea. Uh, Madame Lagarde? Yes, Borger. I think it's uh, really time for Europe to play team, to flex muscles, and I can think of five areas where we can be a formidable power. I've mentioned the purchasing power. I would mention the trading power. We are the top trading partner of 80 countries in the world. Now that is power. We are a formidable technology power. Why is Airbus winning the race? Because we've put our strength, our innovation capacity together. And I would add that we are a pension power. You know, we always talk about the, the financial power of Japan when it uses its pension funds. We have incredible pension resources and capacity that could be deployed on a much broader basis and if we played as a team. And I would finally add that we have to be that moral power that puts values ahead of 
some of the gains and the savings that we have focused too much here and there in the past. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Prime Minister Heger, a moral power. Well, thank you very much, my colleagues. I mean, great thoughts that you shared just, just now. And so I'll just add, you know, the, the founders of European Union, they had a great vision, great, great dream. And they wanted us to live uh, in peace and in a high quality of life. And they knew that to reach this, we need to be faithful to basic principles, freedom, rule of law, human dignity, uh, equal rights. And when you look at, at these values, you might think easy. Well, in a everyday life, we know that's not easy at all. And they knew as well. We know that democracy is not for granted. We know now that peace is not for granted. So basically, I think the recipe is, let's be faithful to our values every day in every our decision that we make. Let's compare the decision to these values. Let's check it whether, whether we uh, are in line with these values. And please, let's not compromise. Because the comfort that we live gets us easy astray, gets us away from these values. If we stick to these values, if we're faithful to these values, I'm sure we'll do the right decisions and I'm sure will be so attractive for the whole world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I think I'm uh, talking on behalf of all the people that have listened to this uh, panel. Uh, I think we got even more optimistic on behalf of uh, European leadership. It's been a pleasure uh, sharing this panel, a panel that I think with what you said, and I, I, know, I, I know you, all are faithful to our European uh, values. So thank you so much.